Hello, I'm Diana Falzone, a senior reporter at Mediate. Welcome to Behind the Byline, where I speak with some of the most fascinating people in media and politics today. On Behind the Byline, we get to know who they are, where they came from, and what makes them tick. A person first, a public figure second. Today, I'm joined by Oliver Darcy, who recently left CNN as their senior media reporter, where he helmed the network's Reliable Sources newsletter. He launched his own independent media newsletter, Status, this summer. Oliver, it is great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You launched Status in August, right on the heels of your announcement and Reliable Sources that you would be parting with CNN. Then... In mid-September, you broke a major scoop that journalist Olivia Nussi was on leave from New York Magazine for engaging in an inappropriate relationship with former presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who she was covering. What was the immediate impact for status? Did you get a boom in subscribers, calls from wannabe investors? What, it, what did it do for your newsletter? Um, you know, it, it certainly... Uh helped get the name out there. Um, but I, I do, I do want to say, you know, there's, there's been some people that have been like, you must've gotten thousands of subscribers off of this story. And, and that's just also, you know, um, it, to convert a paid subscriber, uh, anyone who's done it knows it's not, it's not so simple and there's no real, uh, magic, uh, hack that you can, that you can, uh, pull out of your hat to, to do it. So, you know, it, it, it helped certainly, um, I think for people who weren't aware that I was writing this independent media newsletter after leaving CNN, and it helped resurface my name in their inboxes and they saw it around. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that was, uh, that was helpful. But um, at the end of the day too, the, the story, you know, it was, I reported the story obviously because it was um, very newsworthy and, um, and, and that was the, that was the intention. Right. No. And, it, and a lot has transpired since you broke, the story, Olivia filed a lawsuit against her ex-fiance, Ryan Lizza, who's been benched on Politico as they investigate mm -hmm. Olivia's claims against him. And Olivia was let go from New York Magazine last month. And throughout this timeline of events, the media has covered the saga in, in various ways. Some outlets focusing on her ethical judgment, which is fair, um, but many, particularly the gossip rags, have um, in essence slut shamed her. They've used Instagram images of her in a bathing suit top as their mm -hmm. feature image and the Daily Beast, where she was once a staff reporter, they imagined the quote-unquote sext sent between her and RFK Jr. Um, to the chagrin of some Daily Beast uh, former staffers. Those outlets took your original story and ran with it in some fairly off-colored ways. Does that frustrate you as the journalist who broke the story? Because you, you were um, very candid in Business Insider that you know, for the reasons you cover that story, mm -hmm. why it was, um, you know, of, of national interest, why it met that bar. Yeah, I um, and I've stuck with that, you know, the, in, in my newsletter, I, I haven't really given much attention, if any, to some of these tabloid stories. I think the Daily Mail has now run dozens and dozens of, of stories and they were using pictures of her, you know, from her Instagram and uh, in, in ways that I obviously found to be inappropriate. Um, it, 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 whether it's frustrating or not, you know, when anytime you, you break a big story, you sort of, you put it out into the world and, um, people do all sorts of different things with it. Um, mm -hmm. I obviously, you know, I, I don't know if I expected that. Um, I, I definitely, you know, anticipated that the tabloids would, um, probably find the story to be of, of significant interest, but, um, I, 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 I you know, I, I don't think it's been appropriate the way some of this coverage has, um, particularly from the tabloids, has gone. And uh, it's, 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 it's very unfortunate. And honestly, uh, you know, for, for me, I covered her and the media aspect of it because she's a journalist, I'm a media reporter, but um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is also, you know, not getting the, um, you know, he, he should be a more significant part of the story for others covering it. You know, he was on Fox News um, after the story broke and, uh, host Martha McCallum barely um, discussed the issue with him. And I found that to be, um, you know, I mean, very glaring to say the least. And uh, he he deserves to to get some uh, tough questions uh, directed his way. Yeah, um, uh, there's definitely been some um, thought pieces saying why is a journalist um, 
being held to a higher standard than someone who might serve in a potential mm -hmm. uh, cabinet, presidential cabinet. And speaking of which, we are days, days away from the presidential election. It's crazy right now. In one of the closest races in history, Trump's rhetoric against the media and his perceived enemies has leveled up. The MSG rally has drawn intense criticism for the rhetoric and Trump speakers that made racist remarks, some saying it was comedy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, meanwhile, during this time, the Washington Post announced it would not issue an endorsement for, for president for the first time in decades. According to reporting, Jeff Bezos himself spiked an endorsement of Kamala Harris, which had been drafted. Post staffers have quit as a result, and we learned that a staggering 250,000 people canceled their subscriptions. Um, the assumption being that many feel Bezos spiked the endorsement because he fears a second Trump term. Uh, we know that Bezos wrote an op-ed in response to the backlash. You've been covering this a bit, um, actually quite a lot. <laughs> what do you make of the decision from the Washington Post? Um, well, I, I don't think it, it, it wasn't a decision from the Washington Post, right? It was a decision from Jeff Bezos. And we know, uh, thanks to even a meeting this week where the opinion editor, David Shipley, told staff that he tried to convince Bezos to change his mind and Bezos was set in his way. Um, and so, uh, you know, what do I think of the decision? I think it's it's quite cowardly. Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of problems with it or, or issues with it. One being the timing, obviously, you know, we're just days out uh, from a presidential election. So if Bezos actually didn't want to endorse in the 2024 election, uh, why didn't he make this announcement uh, some time ago? And then the second thing, too, you know, outside the timing, it is a little bit strange that, um, the Washington Post has been endorsing candidates for decades. Mm -hmm. They just endorsed a slew of Democratic candidates, actually, um, a few weeks ago for other races. But um, why would the Post, of all the elections, they decided that they wanted to sit out the most high stakes, uh, consequential election in recent memory, where you have an autocrat wannabe um, competing uh, for office, may, might win office, uh, and he's running against a pretty, you know, run of the mill Democrat. Why is that the election that the Washington Post decided to sit out on? It doesn't make any any real sense, even when you consider the timing. Like we knew um, even a few months ago that this was going to be the race. And so I, I think if there was like, you know, Mitt Romney running against uh, Barack Obama and they decided, oh, well, we just don't think we should be weighing in. That's like that's like one thing. But when you have someone who's using very disturbing rhetoric, not only against the press, but against fellow politicians. Like, you know, as we're recording this, the story on CNN is about uh, Trump fantasizing about uh, Liz Cheney being shot. You know, th th this is very, not, it's way outside the, the, the bounds um, of normal political rhetoric. And why the Washington Post wouldn't be able to say that in its editorial voice is, is very uh, perplexing. And the only thing that comes to mind is Jeff Bezos has a lot of business before the U.S. government. Uh, he really, his baby is Blue Origin, which is a competitor to SpaceX. And with Elon Musk cozying up to Donald Trump, you could see that Jeff Bezos is probably a little reluctant to poke the bear. Yeah, yeah. And, and also to note, this is the first time since 1988 that the Post has not done an endorsement for president. Yeah. So why this one? That's what makes no sense, right? Like it's the most high stakes election. It's when it matters the most. And this is the election that the Washington Post decides to sit on the sidelines. It just doesn't add up. And, and you, you brought up the the temperature uh, is, is getting higher and higher and higher with uh, Trump's rhetoric. You mentioned Liz Cheney. Of course, the, the Trump campaign is saying, no, 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 it's a misinterpretation. That's not what he meant. Um, do you have concerns as a member of the press for members of the press who have reported on Trump? Should he win? I, I think I think everyone should have concerns. Uh, he, he if you take him at his word, you know, uh, his second term will be uh, far more um, uh, dangerous to the freedoms we take for granted on a daily basis than his first term. And so I think certainly there there have to be people should be concerned in the press, you know, there's a lot of things he could do. Um, he could easily, for instance, just kick the press off White House grounds. Like, I don't think that would be even surprising at this point if he won office, but there's other things he can do. And you, the way you're seeing him demonize the press, demonize people in the country as a political opponents by calling them the enemy within and threatening to use military action against them. 
I, I don't know how you can hear this stuff and and not you know and not be quite alarmed. Right. Um, our editor in chief of Mediate attended the MSG rally and he wrote a piece saying that when Trump addressed the press and you know, kind of a jabbing way, mm -hmm. um, the, the crowd would just cheer, cheer. And um, that one reporter snuck away. Um, I'm not sure what the, you know, necessarily the, the reason behind getting out of uh, Madison Square Garden was for that particular journalist, but they weren't going to stay for it. <laughs> right, right. And I think the, the, the alarming thing too, is that in the first administration, I think the press felt like it was in a little more of an assertive position, but as the media industry has faced steep decline, particularly just in the last five years, and you have institutions um, that are struggling, you know, CNN is struggling, the Washington Post is struggling. There's, there's the, the industry from the business standpoint, <clears throat> from a business standpoint is not doing so well. And then you see the editorial leaders also in charge of some of these organizations. And um, moves like from Bezos or Patrick uh, Sun Chiang over at the LA Times, and you wonder whether the the press is even going to have the backbone or ability to really serve as a bulwark against some of Trump's anti democratic tendencies should he win office. Right. Some scholars said that the sign of these non endorsements from the Los Angeles Times and from uh, Washington Post that it was a indicator of anticipatory obedience. Um, I think we also heard Brian Stelter say that on CNN as well. It, it's, it, it could very well be. We, we will have to um, see how this plays out. Um, now, now on a, a lighter note, I want to get to know you a bit better. Okay. Did you always want to be a journalist? Was this something that you, when you were a little kid, you took like your notepad and paper and were snooping around? <laughs> I think I've always been enamored by the, the media since I got internet access, which was, I remember when, um, it was in the 90s, obviously, but I remember when my um, dad um, got a computer and it had America Online and I would get time to use the computer. And back then it was like a 56K modem. So if you were using it, like no one could make phone calls. So it was a big deal. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I would, I, would, I would just, when I was a kid, I would just surf and, and kind of you know, look at the news to some extent. And um, I remember in computer lab doing the same. And when I was in high school, I, I, I joined the, the, the school newspaper immediately as my elective. And I was um, the editor and uh, did, did that throughout high school. And so I was really, yeah, I was, I, I wanted to, to be in journalism and uh, um, I don't know, you just get the bug. And I, I, there's something about being able to have information and to tell it to people before they know other, uh, elsewhere that is just uh that is just really incredible. So I think one of the cool things of being a journalist is that you're on the same footing as um, the most powerful people in society. And so you can hold to account uh, someone like Jeff Bezos by asking questions and publishing a story. You can hold to account the most powerful politicians in Washington by asking questions and, and, and pursuing a story. And so for me too, um, it, it's awesome to deliver news ahead of time to people, but it's also really great to be in, in a unique position where you can, um, where you can hold, hold people accountable. Did you ever have someone advise you about the perils of journalism? Um, as you no. just mentioned about holding truth to power with that comes a lot of um, potential fallout. Um, I don't think anyone's ever advised me. I mean, one of the things too, is when I first got in the media from a business standpoint, uh, I think the media was in a much better, um, a much better footing. Uh, and it wasn't in terminal decline the way it feels like at least some aspects or some sectors of the media are today. Um, but on the holding truth to power, uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 I guess like have I been advised on on the fallout that could happen? Um, I, you know, informally, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm lucky to know um, quite a few people in the industry who I can gut check things with um, and make sure that you know I. I you know, not airing or, or having a blind spot that's going to come back to bite me. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in terms of any formal sit down ever, I, I don't know if I've ever had one of those. I also mean in terms of who you might write about or mm -hmm. um, who might be a subject who doesn't want to be in one of your stories and you're unearthing something they don't want, want the public yeah. to know. Have you had pushback in that sense? 
Oh, totally. I mean, I think everyone everyone has. Uh, there's a lot of people who would prefer not to be written about. Um, and, uh, I, you know, sometimes, you know, people have compelling reasons and you obviously want to hear them out and weigh it. But, um, you know, the way this works, obviously, is if you are a powerful person and there's a legitimate story about you, you know, um, I'm going to pursue that story and publish it if I can. When I was at CNN, I think it was the most uncomfortable because often the people that I was writing about were my bosses or people that I worked with. And you just have to, you know, acknowledge it's a little bit uncomfortable, um, but they're fair stories. And uh, everyone should, you know, journalists, journalists pester a lot of people in a lot of different industries. And uh, they should also understand that, uh, you know, if there are, if there are, if there's a story that's, that's relative to them, that they, that someone's going to cover it. Right. And also the idea of don't shoot the messenger, which I think gets lost, especially in the social media verse when you have X, which is highly inflammatory. And I know you're not a fan of, um, and it, it, it does hinder, and I wouldn't say hinder, but it does put more, um, fear, I think to, to, a, to a journalist doing those kinds of stories because, they become a target and there's a lot of unhinged people who then mm -hmm. think they have access to you in a way that in the past that wasn't um, that wasn't as readily available. One solution, though, is to get off X because I have not been on there for over a year and I feel a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're not constantly being attacked. You know, I think it's boring for a lot of these trolls out there or these um, these people to attack you and uh, brigade you on, on X if you're not there. Um, they lose interest very quickly. You're no longer a fun punching bag. And so I would I would really encourage people to consider just dropping that um, that social media platform from their habit, uh, if only just for their mental health, but also for the ethics of why are you um, participating in, in Elon Musk's uh, machine that's that's basically um, become a pro Trump uh, pro Trump machine at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I would uh, contend with that. Um, I follow you on Instagram. A couple mm -hmm. times I saw your post, especially um, there were some shots of your wife that I was like, wow, that's beautiful. The way he's capturing like the New York City skyline or an apartment building and, and the moon. And I was like, he's really, really good. And then Thank I you. saw, yeah, you're welcome. And then I saw some more stuff and I was like, you know, he's kind of like, is this, is this like a professional you know, hobby? Are you uh, like a, a photography hobbyist? When did you fall in love with it? Um, you know, I when I first moved to New York City, I um, didn't know anyone here. And so I um, picked up a hobby of just photography and I would go around, you know, when on my free time, just walking around and taking photos. And it was something that I could do when I really didn't know. I, I didn't know anyone here. And I certainly couldn't, you know, afford to do a lot of things. But taking pictures was was something that I I found to be um, a fun hobby. And then I lost I lost kind of touch with that um, as I got busier. And uh, about a, you know, I guess a year ago or so, I, I, I was like thinking, I'm like, I need to have something where I can log off the internet, I can walk around outside and get fresh air and uh, just be a little bit disconnected for some period of time because it's just not healthy to be on your laptop working 24 seven. And then I thought, you know, I really should get back into photography because I really enjoyed that. And so I, I did. And, and, you know, now that's like, I, I just, I, I really love it. it. It forces you out into the world. It forces you to go to places you may, might not even typically go to um, in, in New York at a, you know, cause you just, everyone's kind of a person, people, and everyone gets into their habits in New York, mm -hmm. especially they don't leave the neighborhoods. And if you're wanting to take a photo of something, like I might walk to Grand Central and take a, you know, want to do some photos there, or I might walk up to the Upper West Side. And so it forces you out of your comfort zone a little bit. And um, I just, I just really enjoy capturing things on camera. What was the first photo you took that inspired your hobby? Was there a, a, a photo that you still remember to this day? You're like, that's my favorite. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's, it's really difficult actually to pick up, to pick a favorite. I, I certainly think, you know, if you look back on your first photos, you're like, eh, uh, you know, there's there's different, you know, it just kind of looked like looking back on, on your writing from like a few years ago, you you can see where you've grown. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what my, what my favorite photo is, it really, it just kind of depends on my mood. I also would say, too, that I've always been interested in graphic design and, and design, and I'm not like great at Photoshop or, um, you know, or 
even Lightroom, but I'm, you know, fluent in it. And, and so that's also kind of inspired my like love for photography. I think I just like, um, I just like design and, and, and graphic elements and, and beautiful images. And, um, you know, that's honestly what I miss about, um, it, you know, one thing about print that was really nice is mm -hmm. we used to get these glossy magazines and everything was like, you know, beautifully shot and staged. And we really, we're really now in an era to some extent of the internet where everything's kind of a lot of, a lot of bad ads, right? And then just not, not fun. I, I will tell you that I've heard a lot of compliments about your status newsletter and how it's formatted, formatted, and the fonts. So you obviously chose all of that, right? I I, I did, yeah. I, I you know one of the things too is about the fonts. What drives me a little bit crazy is that if you open my newsletter on Apple uh, on a Apple Mail or the iPhone Mail app, it looks different than if you open it up in Gmail or Outlook. And that's because Gmail and Outlook refuse to support certain fonts. They only support like 10 fonts or something, which I think is crazy. Um, but uh, that drives me a little bit crazy because I, I did spend some time trying to find nice fonts uh, for the newsletter. And I'm not even entirely sure I'm still happy with them. But yeah, I, I did. Uh, I did focus a lot on the design. And then I worked with um, a design artist. Uh, her name is Courtney Gooch. Uh, and she's in New York and we, we, um, you know, she, she designed the, the, uh, the logo and, um, came up with the color scheme. And so, um, I'm indebted to her as well. And you're a couple months in and you spoke with, um, our editor in chief, Aiden McLaughlin, right when status launched for, mm -hmm. for press club. Um, how are you liking it? Are you, are you finding it to be more taxing? Is there, what are the pros or the cons? It's not more taxing in that, like, I'm doing the same work as I was doing when I was at CNN. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of like the editorial work, I wouldn't say it's more taxing. I think um, certainly when you are, um, when, when it's your, um, you own the brand and, you, and you, you're dependent on the brand, there's a lot more drive to deliver scoops and to really focus on things. Um, and I actually think that's why companies like CNN should really consider um, changing their pay model to incentivize people to have some skin in the game because it really it really motivates you in a way that you're not motivated if you're just getting a flat salary. Um, but I love it. I, I, I have um, no regrets about um, doing this. I think um, I think that status is on a very good trajectory. And um, I will hopefully have some more um, you know, to say about that in the months ahead. I'm, I'm only two and a half months in, so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, just kind of, I'm, I'm still in a, I think, a growth stage and I'm yeah. kind of trying to still, to some extent, get my footing. You know, there's a lot of things in the back end that no one sees that I have to uh, spend time working on. And there are things that I want to do. Um, you know, for instance, we're, we're having an event, a, a launch party in a couple of weeks that, you know, um, I've been working on and we just invite out to. So uh, there's a lot more to come. When I saw your initial announcement, my head immediately went to, he's going at it alone. And I always worry with the stories that are, that are a little bit more high risk that one would have to deal with legal threats mm -hmm. and you don't have the muscle of CNN behind you anymore. Did you think about that? Like, oh man, I could get a lot of um, legal demands at, with certain stories and how can I protect myself? Yeah. I mean, that's certainly something that comes to mind. You know, there's a couple of things, um, you know, legal insurance, business insurance, um, those are things that, that are something you have to obviously um, uh, obtain when you're independent. And then there's even other stuff too that's a little less, like a little more boring, just like Getty Images access. Like I, need, I needed to obviously get a subscription of my own to Getty Images and just having the infrastructure to send a newsletter out to people and post online. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I was focused on. But, uh, and, and that's something you don't have to worry about when you're at a major company because they, mm -hmm. they obviously have. Uh, wire photos you can use. There are graphic artists that you can um, ask for images from, you know, there's a whole bunch of, there's a department for everything. And when you're on your own, you, there's no departments to go to, it's just you. Uh, but luckily I will say I have been supported by a lot of people in the industry um, who want to, want to help. And whether that's um, consulting with uh, lawyers pro bono, or whether that's um, working with people um, on other things that they're just happy to lend their expertise to or advice to. I've been, I've been very blessed in that regard. 
Speaking of people within the industry, Brian Stelter, your former colleague, mm -hmm. made a stunning return to CNN after you exited. And then he took the reins of the newsletter he first began. And you also both worked on together. You two seem very supportive of each other rather than in direct competition. Yeah. What's the dynamic between you and Brian now? I mean, the, it's, it's great. I, I talk to Brian um, definitely every day, uh, definitely probably, you know, every few hours I work we text about something because we, we both share a uh, obsession and love of media. And so, you know, when you have those people in the industry, you just kind of, you know, you, you're, you're, and I was, I mean, I've been good friends with Brian for, I mean, I don't know how long have I known Brian, you know, a long time since I started at CNN. So seven years. And so uh, when, and we worked very closely together at, at CNN. So um, I, 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 obviously I think there was a little bit amusing for us to see in, in some, corners of the press or Twitter or whatever, where people were thinking there was this huge like animosity or rivalry. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're very supportive of each other. Now that you've gone independent, has your point of view changed in how you see mainstream media at all? Um, you know, that's a good question, actually. I don't think so. Um, I would say that my one of the reasons I went independent was to some extent because I didn't feel like I could do what I wanted to do inside a giant corporation that was going through a massive transition to digital. Um, and so, and I also have generally, I think this was obviously um, present when I was writing the CNN Reliable Sources newsletter, I, I found myself um, uh, disagreeing, I think, with a lot of the editorial decisions um, at major you know, media organizations. Um, particularly when it comes around covering right-wing extremism and Donald Trump. And so I don't think my view has changed on, on that, but when I'm, you know, no longer inside that machine and looking out at it, I guess it looks slightly different. I don't know. I don't, I, 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 I have the same views of it, but I, you know, I guess like I didn't, my views didn't change because I went independent. The reason I went, or part of the reason, a good portion of the reason I went independent was because I didn't feel like inside a giant corporation was necessarily maybe the best home for me. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Thank you for, for joining us today and sharing your insights. And I am excited to see the trajectory of status and what scoop you're going to break next because you're on a roll. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're not going away anytime soon. We're, I mean, just getting started. And I um, you know, I, I, I hope to uh, be back here in a year from now and uh, be able to share more, I think, on what that looks like. So I'm excited. Well, I, I would love that. You have an open invitation. For more insightful interviews covering media and politics, go to Mediate.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube.